2 Corinthians 11. Get your Bibles out. You are fortunate, you are blessed to bring a Bible to church, to believe the Bible. You're blessed by God. God opened up your eyes. God, uh, His Spirit led you to read the Bible, to believe the Bible. Satan. We're going to be talking about Satan for, I call this Satan 101. An introductory course, which will end up being an in-depth study of Satan. Our adversary. What are some of the other names the Bible gives him? Anybody? Lucifer. Lucifer. Huh? Beast. The ancient serpent, that old serpent. What else? Other names for the devil in the Bible. The father of, yeah, he's the father of liars and lies. Prince of the power of the air. Beelzebub. Belial. Leviathan. Anybody else? Baal. Our adversary. He is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says. Well, there's a bunch of them. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles. I have a picture of a false apostle up there. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The name Lucifer, do you know what it means, Gary? Um, light bearer. Lucis is light. Um, the... Extension, offer, is like phosphorus. Um, phos is light as well. But Lucifer means light bearer or angel of light. It's literally what it means. And the King James got it right because it matches 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. And the phrase angel of light essentially means Lucifer. So that you have a double witness in the Bible of what his name is. You have a double witness in the Bible of what his, his character is. He, he, he was in heaven the, um, the anointed cherub that covereth. It's what Ezekiel says. And um, so it's assumed that before his fall... Um, before pride was found in him, he was the, I guess, the reflection of God's light. He was the most beautiful angel in all of heaven. The Bible said every precious stone was his covering. This is Ezekiel. And that he had, and we'll get into all these aspects, he had musical instruments literally put into his body. And if that sounds strange... There are animals all over the world that have musical instruments. What are some of those? Crickets use their wings. Birds, they chirp. They sing. They sing songs. What else? Huh? Frogs. Okay. They, they have a little song that they give, mating season. Elephants. Okay. Huh? Monkeys, I guess, yeah. Um, elk, they'll, what they call bugle, they'll sound out a, a sound and so on. So it's, it's, not, it's not that strange when you think about how God designed the animal kingdom. Different animals have different sounds that they make. And so the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes, the Bible says, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. 
So let's look at Satan. Let's look at his power. We're going to look at his devices, how he works. We're going to look at how he can be defeated. Amen. And he needs to be defeated. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3. It's the first place we see uh, Satan show up in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 3, right after God has made woman. And he has put Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, we don't have a time frame. We don't know exactly how long Adam and Eve were in the garden together. Uh, we don't know if it was the next day after God created the woman. We don't know if it was a week, a month, a year. We just don't know. But we know that at some point after God created woman and brought her to the man, that the serpent showed up in the garden and he is, he is going to deceive Eve. So the very first place we find Satan in the Bible, we, we get this understanding of his overall character. We learn his devices. We learn what is in his nature. Can, let me ask you a question. Can Satan change who he is? Well, I mean, can, here's, here's what I'm asking. Can Satan repent and say that he's sorry for how he's been and then follow God again? Can he do that? We don't find any place in the Bible where God offers redemption to angels. And it, Satan literally is a beast. He is described as a serpent. He's described as a dragon. He has seven heads and ten horns. We know that much. And beasts have a nature about them that they cannot change. A dog will always be a dog and he'll always act like a dog. And no matter how well you train him, he's still going to be a dog. Okay? And he's going to sniff other dogs' backsides. And I mean, that's just their nature. You can't train certain things out of them. That's how they are. And so when it comes to the devil, he is the way he is. He is not capable of altering his nature. He is always going to be this way. And the Bible talks about, when it talks about the false prophets and the false teachers in 2 Peter, uh, Peter said, these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. And so the thing that is already going to happen with Satan is that at the end, he is going to be taken and he is going to be destroyed. He's going to be thrown in the lake of fire. So that's where he's appointed. There's nothing in the scripture that says that he's going to be sorry for what he did and that he's going to change. It's not going to happen. So Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And if you think about the nature of serpents, do you ever hear them walking up to you? No, you'll never know that they're there. They're very subtle in their movements. You might, you might hear a leaf crackle. You might hear that. But when it comes to their movements, you would never know. If they were in your house, you would never know they were there until you happen to see one. And then when you happen to see one in your house, it's, yeah, war's on. Katie, bar the door. So anyway, so he, that's, that's his nature. God designed him that way. And he said unto the woman, the very first words recorded, Yea, hath God said. Very first words. And his nature is, that he despises God's word. He hates it. He despises it. He doesn't want God's word around. He doesn't want it to have an influence on man. His nature is such that whatever God said, his nature is that he is going to try to get man to defile and turn away from God's word and God's commandments. That's his nature. That's how he always has been. That's how he is now. And that's how he'll always be. He'll never stop doing what he's doing. He'll never stop in your life 
trying to get you to doubt God's word. He'll never stop trying to keep you from reading God's word. He'll never stop trying to get you to not believe God's word. He will always attack God's word. Okay? That's his primary focus. You look through the scriptures. That's you, every time you see him, that's what he's doing. He hates God. He hates Jesus. And he hates God's people with a passion. And we're going to see more about that a little bit later on. First words out of his mouth. Yea, hath God said. His first sentence is a question. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. In other words, did God say this? Did God say this? First thing, the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, ye shall not eat of it. Now this is man's nature. Man's nature loves to add to God's word. Add more restrictions than what God laid down. That is man's nature. That is religion's nature. It's to always add more restrictions than what God actually lays down. That is legalism. That's the core of legalism. Where if a church or a denomination or religion says you can't do this or you must do this, but God's word never gives that prohibition or it never gives that commandment. That's man assuming that or that's man making that up because Eve said, neither shall ye touch it. God never said anything about that. He didn't say to Adam, you can't touch it. He just said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. That's what's going to happen. But she added, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, now his second thing, ye shall not surely die. You know, God said, if you look in Genesis 2, God said the words, in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. He said, ye shall surely die. Satan said, ye shall not surely die. He's contradicting what God said. Okay, he's the opposite. If God is light, Satan is darkness, and he represents darkness. Ye shall not surely die. And then, for God doth know. Now he's introducing a replacement or a mystery doctrine. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now that that has been planted in Eve, every religion, every human being, has it in their nature to want to be more than what they are. That's in our nature. We want to climb higher. We want to go faster. We want to do things that no man has ever done before. So now we're flying through the air. Now we're flying in space. Now we're building tall buildings. And now we are moving about faster than any man or in, in history has ever moved about. That's what we're doing. Man's nature is to always be more than he was. So... Right here, you see the seeds of the doctrine of evolution. Evolution says that it, it gives this false idea that man used to be a lower life form. And that over the millions of years, genetic mutations have entered in and man has become better than he used to be. So the obvious conclusion of evolution is that man will be better and more capable, more powerful than he is right now. And we're living in the age where we can see that now coming in a very short while. 20, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, not so much. 
But we're now living in an age where man knows how to read the genetic code. Then, and that was about 15, 16, 17 years ago, the Human Genome Project began and men started reading the human genetic code, learning what part of your DNA does what in your body. So now they've mapped out the human genome. So now, once man knows how to read DNA, like he can read a book, because God said it was a book, then man wants to learn how to write DNA. Or I'll say, rewrite DNA. To make man more than he is. There are books all over the place being written by the top scientists, the top geneticists, the top thinkers in the world that are now very clearly seeing humans being in charge of their own evolution. Humans undertaking their own transformation to eliminate diseases, to eliminate aging, to eliminate death itself. Human, Time Magazine put out as its lead article, they did an interview with Ray Kurzweil just a few years ago. Ray Kurzweil made the prediction that by 2049, man will be able to make himself immortal, meaning man will beat death. He will cheat death. He will alter himself genetically, alter himself technologically, so that he does not die. So let's look back at what Satan said. Satan said, ye shall not surely die. So now man thinks that he can erase God's curse. God's curse is on man because of sin. Sin is what brought death into the world. Man wants to continue to sin and then be immortal as a sinner. And God won't allow it. God won't have it. Because once Adam and Eve sinned, God put an angel with a flaming sword that went every way guarding access to the tree of life so that man no longer has access to immortality. The tree of life would have given him immortality. And God put a cherub there with a flaming sword guarding the way of the tree of life so that man, as a sinner, must die. That's God's decree. But man, now we are on the verge. We're, we're about ready to enter into the age of man's immortality. It's going to be a process. It's not going to happen overnight. But it's going to happen quite possibly in our lifetime. If the Lord tarries his coming, man's going to alter himself in such a way is that he's going to attempt to be immortal. That's what Satan put into Eve's mind. And now that has been passed down to every man, every human. When I was a young boy... I used to read comic books. I would read Superman, and I wanted to be Superman. Thought for a while that I was actually going to make it. I wanted to fly. I wanted to be impervious to pain. I could be shot with bullets, and they just bounce right off, and able to leap tall buildings with a single bound, and all of that stuff. It's what I wanted. Okay? Man has it in his nature to want to be more than what he is. Now, God has provided a way for man to be immortal. It's the cross. Man must first submit to God, submit to the cross, recognize that he is a sinner, and understand that God in no way is he going to resurrect this old body and us inherit immortality in this old body. 
That's not part of the deal. The deal is we get rid of this body because it's full of sin. And then God gives us a new body which will be without sin and it will be immortal. But man wants to remain disobedient to God and yet he wants to live forever. He doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to have diseases. He wants to be as God's little g. That's what he wants. And so religion after religion after religion has promised that to mankind. But let's get back to looking at Satan now. Satan's devices. Um, we know, and we just were studying this, 2 Corinthians 11, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin in Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And what Paul is saying here is how Satan was, uh, from Paul, it was about 4,000 years before Paul came along. It's almost about 6,000 years now that we've come along. But for the last 6,000 years, the devil has not changed his nature. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. How the devil got to Eve and convinced her to disobey God, that's how the devil does it with us. His methods and his operation are still the same. 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. When we study the word, then we learn our enemy. We learn the tactics of our enemy. If we know how our enemy works against us, then it helps us then to be able to defend against his tactics. There's more than one reason why you went a day not wanting to read your Bible. Number one, it was in your flesh to not want to read it, but the devil also does not want you to read God's word. There is always a spiritual aspect to the war against God's word in your personal life. If you've ever had a time where you doubted God's word, I mean, that's part of becoming more faithful and God helping us with our faith is that sometimes we doubt what God says, but there is also a spirit that is trying to get you to doubt and disbelieve God's word. There is always going to be a spiritual aspect to the war against our Bible in our life, in our church, in denominations, in ministries around the world, in Christians around the world. There's always going to be the spiritual aspect of Satan hating God's word. Turn to um, Matthew 13. Matthew 13. In the parable of the seed and the sower, in Matthew 13, he says uh, in verse 3, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell to by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. When he gives the interpretation of the parable, over in verse 18, he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. And I think Mark, when he gives this parable, he actually says, Satan cometh, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away the, that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. In other words, gospel track goes, gets passed out, or a DVD uh, with a sermon on it, gets handed to somebody, they may watch it, they may listen to a CD, or they may look at the gospel tract, and immediately the devil is there, or a devil is there in their life, and immediately says to them, you don't want to read that. Throw that thing in the trash. That's religion. You're not a religious person. You do whatever you want to. There is no God. 
And that person thinks that he's thinking this on his own, but he's not. He's got a devil. He's got a spirit that is working in him to get him to immediately reject God's word. Whenever a tract is thrown away, whenever a DVD is, is thrown in the trash, whenever a sermon is heard and, and a guy says in his heart, I don't believe that, I don't want to hear that stuff, uh, you just take that stuff away. That is the devil working or a devil, a spirit working in that person to re getting them to reject in, as quick as possible God's word. As quick as possible. The devil does not in any way want that seed of God's word to take root. To start to grow. Because then he's got other ways of working against it. Even if it does start to germinate in a person's life. Even if he does start to think about it a little bit. Well, you know, maybe, hey, you know, maybe that verse is right. Maybe I do need to repent of my sins. I know I've done some bad things. I know... I believe in God. Maybe I need to do this. Then Satan has other tactics. But his immediate attack is to try to get as that person as far away from God's word as possible. Do you believe that? That's his tactic. That's his primary tactic. He hates God's word. Does not want the average person out there to have any... To have the word of God have any influence in that person's life. The word of God to the devil is a dangerous thing. And he can't have it. His goal, we, we're going to read this later on. His goal is to attain God's throne. The people standing in his way are the Bible believers. In order, we've got to get rid of the Bible believers. We have to get rid of the word. So it's number one tactic. As soon as the word is sown, immediately come down, devour that word so that it has no effect in that person's life. Then, back in verse 5, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And if you look over in verse uh, 20, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So this is after the seed has been sown and the devil is unsuccessful in catching it away or destroying it immediately. Now it's starting to, starting to germinate, starting to grow a little bit. But, verse 21, Yet hath he not rooted in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So Satan's next plan is to try to convince that person that, yes, while they may have believed John 3.16, they may have believed Romans 6.23, and they may have prayed a prayer, the next tactic is that we're going to build up hardness against other places in the Bible. Let's say that person likes to drink. And they don't want to give up their alcohol. So they're in church for a while. Next thing you know, the pastor is going to preach a message on liquor drinking. On alcohol and having beer in your refrigerator and things like that. And the devils are going to get in that person and they're just going to start to get angry. I don't believe there's anything wrong with that. Well, the Bible clearly says this. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And all of a sudden now, the devil, or a devil, a spirit, has put a stone of offense in that person's life, and all of a sudden now, there's something in the Bible that they don't believe. And that pastor, is gonna, he's going to have an altar call, and he's going to ask people to come down and get saved, or he's going to ask people to come down and repent of liquor drinking, or get, go home to pour the beer out. And that person's going to get mad. And he's going to walk out of that church angry. And he's going, I'm not going back to that church. Boom. It worked. It worked. Oh, he still might believe John 3.16. But all those parts in the Bible that speak out against liquor drinking, strong drink, wine and strong drink, they don't believe that. Boom, they're out. So that's plan B. Then, 
We have um, in verse 7, some fell among thorns, the thorns sprung up and choked them. So over here in verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Mark says the lust of other things choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So that guy or that gal, they've got sinful habits. They like the world. They like watching stuff on TV or they are looking at things on the internet they shouldn't look at. Or they've just got other sins going on in the background in their life and they're not being honest about it. And those sins start choking out the influence of God's word. And all of a sudden now, the person is spending their time with their sins, but they're not spending time with God's word. And those sins are like thorns, are like nettles, they're like weeds growing up in your garden, and they're going to choke out your tomato plants, your okra, it's going to choke out your radishes, going to choke out your lettuce, it's going to choke out things that you're trying to grow in your garden. Those things are going to choke them out. And they decide then that they love their sin more than they love God's word. Boom. They're out. And I've seen it. I've seen it all. In the years I've been in church. Growing up in church. And, and over the years I've seen it all. I've seen stony ground. I've seen stubbornness in people. I've seen bullheadedness in people. I've seen sins choking out the word of God. I've seen it all. And all of that is Satan's attack on the power and the influence of God's word. It's what it is. Then, let's look at um, verse 24. Same chapter. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. That's God. And what he did was he sowed the word to Adam by way of a commandment. That was the word of God to Adam, and it was good seed. Adam could have, with that commandment, and obedience to that commandment, could have lived forever in the Garden of Eden, having access to the tree of life, staying away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He could have lived forever. But then, what happened? Verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Who is that enemy? That enemy is Satan. Satan is the one who came and sowed the tares. So what did Satan do? What did God do? God spoke to Adam. What did Satan do? Satan spoke to Eve. He gave her the adverse or the opposite of God's word. She believed Satan, didn't believe God, and so now death brought into the world by the words that Satan spoke where Eve believed what he said. And it was all an attack against God's word. And so, um, verse 30 let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather my wheat into the barn. And then he gives the interpretation of that in verse 38. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So, I mean, the first two parables that Jesus taught here are the exact and even even in between that in Matthew 13 in between that in verse 31 he gives the parable of the mustard seed and he says that's your faith mustard seeds this big but it, when it's 
put into the good ground, it grows up this humongous tree. And he said, that's your faith. You just, just believe a little bit in God's word. And all of a sudden, that belief will spring forth into great and mighty things that God does in the believer's life. That's the power of God's word. And the devil knows that. He knows it. He knows that if he's got people who believe what God said, every word in the Bible is pure, and you believe that, the devil knows that you are dangerous. And he'll try to eat you up. Has he ever tried that? Brian, has he ever tried that with you? George? Chris? Scotty? He'll try to eat you up. Because you're dangerous. Because you believe the Bible. Has he not tried to put a stone of offense in your life to get you to be upset with something in the Bible or something the preacher said or something that went on in church? Has he not tried with sins in your life to try to choke out his word and the power of his word in your life? Has he not tried that? And he's not going to stop. He's not going to stop. So here's what we do. As Christians, we take the sword of the word of God, beat it into a plowshare. What's the best way to Get rocks and stuff out of your garden. Plow them up. Plow up the fallow ground, the Bible says. Break up the clods. Get that dirt real nice and soft. And every now and then, God's word has to be a plow. And plow up hardness of your heart. Plow up areas of your life where you're struggling and Satan doesn't want God to win, and God needs to plow that and soften. He needs to soften your heart, just like softening dirt. That's what he's doing. Then, same plow, you're cleaning out all the thorns, the thistles, the tares, and the weeds, the Johnson grass, and everything else, plowing that up. Every time, you've heard me talk about my flower bed. It's time. I've got to get out there now and Pull them stupid thistles out and pull all that grass out of there. I hate those things. And they don't all grow all at once. And I've been pulling stuff out of this same flower bed now for years. Every year. Same, same thing. Why don't they just all pop up at once and I pull them out all at once? Oh, no, 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 no. They'll come up 20 at a time. As soon as I get them up, turn around two weeks later, there's some more of them. Pull them up. Next time, two weeks later, there's more of them. Pull them up. And it's always going to be that way until you die. See, Christianity is a little work. Work out your own salvation, right? It takes a little work, does it not, to get the thorns and the thistles out of your life. It takes a little work to break up the clods in your life it takes a little bit of effort on your part but it's worth the effort is it not that's that's just satan's attack all right now let's break this down let's go back to genesis chapter 3 the very first thing that satan said is yea hath god said very first words out of his mouth he asked a he he brings question. He brings question. Now, let me say this. God does not have a problem with you questioning God. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. God does not have a problem with you asking him questions. He's there to give answers. He knows we don't know everything. In fact, he knows we don't know much of anything but he wants to teach us, and he doesn't mind you asking questions. He does, God doesn't mind you having, you're reading the Bible and something you don't understand. God doesn't have a problem you asking. You're reading the Bible, and, and you see something that you think, well, maybe it's, you know, I read on the internet, well, this is a mistake in the Bible. God, is this a mistake in the Bible? God doesn't have a problem with you asking those, I, I've asked God those questions. God, is this a mistake in the Bible? You ask God, 
God will always lead you into truth. God will always lead you into what's right. God will always show you the truth of His Word. God has never... This goes in a list of things God never said. God never said, Oops, I made a mistake in the Bible. God never said that. God never said that to you. God never said that in the Bible. God never said there are errors in the Bible. God never said it. He always always says that his word is right, his word is pure, his word is incorruptible, his word is undefiled, his word is everlasting, and you, if, listen, if it's in this Bible, you can believe it. And it doesn't matter. Listen, they're starting to get at us. It's, it's going to, it's, there's going to come a time when they're going to come at us for believing that God created the world in six days, 6,000 years ago, and that man actually did live with dinosaurs. There was an article Lisa showed to me yesterday, I haven't read it yet, but home schools and certain Christian schools, I think it was in Florida, they're coming under attack because their curriculum is teaching the creation week that God created the world, the universe, in literally six days, and that man walked with dinosaur. And of course, the scoffers are coming out mocking that, saying that's ignorance, and, and I guarantee you the liberals and the progressives want to get involved in the home schools and the Christian schools all over this country to put a stop to that. Well, you know what that is? That is parents teaching their children that the Bible is right and man's wrong. And they have been coming against that for years. So don't be surprised at the liberals and the progressives in this country attacking the home school efforts all over the country because they're teaching their children that this Bible is right. And it is right. Amen? Father in heaven, if Satan, if we ever hear it, Lord, that the Bible may not be true, the Bible may not be right, this verse may not be right, may not be translated right, or maybe, maybe there's an error in the text or whatever. God, that's the devil. That's not you. That's not your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit never tells us that the Bible's wrong. Your Spirit confirms in us that your Word is right. It's right in everything that it says. And God, you swore that you would preserve that Word forever. You swore that. God, you're not a man that you should lie. So, Father, we believe your Word, we trust your Word, and any time, Father, we have doubts, because the devil will always try to feed us doubt. What time we doubt, Father, we'll come to you and we'll ask you for help. Like that one Saturday, God, when the Jehovah's Witness had my mind twisted around for about 10, 15 minutes. God, I called unto you and you answered me and you confirmed to me that your Bible was right. Father, do that. There's people, Lord, that may be sitting here, may be listening online, that sometime this week or last week, God, the devil sowed seeds of doubt. He said, yea, hath God said. And Father, just bless that person. Don't be angry at them. Bless that person and show them and convince them, God, that everything in your word is absolutely right. And Father, this is how we're going to grow. This is how we're going to make it in your kingdom is by what's in this word and the power of of our faith in this word. Bless your people today. Convince them, God, that this Bible's right. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen.